Well, hey there, Lusketeers. Welcome back to the podcast. My name is Levi. My name is Jenny. And we are your hosts, and we welcome you to this brand new year. Gosh, 2024. 2024. That's the that's my uh, shofar. Oh. I'm, it's the new, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to Rosh Hashanah it a little bit here. Oh, wow. That's here a I good go. Good job. You like that? Mm-hmm. Um, that was such like a flashback saying the word shofar to like my. Growing up, I remember so many pastors at the church that uh, I grew up in and worked at that would have like a shofar sitting on an, on a shelf in their office, you know? Now, for anyone who doesn't know, what is a shofar? It's a ram's horn. And the high priest for... in the Old Testament would blow them like at Jericho to make the walls fall down. So where were all these pastors getting these shofars? Like from Israel? There's got to be a website. I don't know. Maybe, actually, no, these would have been predating the internet a little bit, wouldn't it? Oh. So I'm not sure where they got them. Maybe Israel. Have you ever wanted a shofar in your office? Shofar so good. No, I don't. I <laughs> Have I ever wanted one? I don't know. I don't have anything against them. I just don't know. I don't know what I would do with it if I had one. And your life hasn't been like changed. Like, oh my gosh, I learned about the shofar and I really need one. No, but I would say if my life was missing some element that only a shofar could provide, would I know it? Maybe I am going without Wow. I will say this. I don't want one in my office. That makes sense. If I had one, where would I keep it? <laughs> in a special <laughs> special <laughs> shofar container of sorts. Like a saxophone would be kept in with very purple velvet that would wow. keep it. Like that's what I would have. I, I can't even picture where you would. <clears throat> no, would it would be in like a shofar. Um, what, what's that word I'm looking for? Case. Case. A shofar case. Okay. I wouldn't keep it on a shelf where everyone could see it. Like you would just be in like it like a guitar a guitar case? A dark case on the outside. On the guitar. inside it would be purple. A guitar. Did I you say guitar saying. case? <laughs> I said violin. I said it weirdly. And I would want it to have those clasps that when you pop them, they real like the furniture clasps that open real loud. So that when I was when I, when it was good in time for me to have the shofar, I would have to go through the ritual of pulling the case out and popping both clasps loudly. Mm. And they would be really tight to where when I went, it was like thunk, you know, they both thunk thunk. And and then everyone would be like, whoa, he's serious. It's this is a this merits a shofar. <laughs> that's what I would do. Wow. That's that's a lot to think about. I actually have Heard one blown, gave me the chills. Like in a bad way or medium, good way? Medium, good, bad. Like you know? not like, oh my gosh, that was amazing. It was more like, Ooh. I mean, it didn't create so far envy. Like shivers or? No, that, that's, that's a Jenny Lusco. I saved that for you. <laughs> All the shivers. It was more like, oh, that's pretty interesting. Huh. Um, but you think about like Jericho, the, the shofar being blown, the walls falling down. That's the energy you, you would want it to have. Yeah. But the actual sound was like, oh, oh, oh no. Ugh. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. oh, that horn has turned. <laughs> and maybe that's the point. Maybe God picked that to be the method by which the walls would come down simply because it's not a very menacing sound. Mm. It's not like a bugle. It's not like war cry. Like a, it's like high pitch or low. I don't know. Maybe the person who I heard blowing it wasn't very good at it. Mm. Have you heard a didgeridoo being blown? Mm-hmm. That's a nice sound. I do like that sound. Yeah. It's like when the Bible says like not many wise, not many like brilliant are called, but God's chosen the foolish things of this world. I think if he had picked a didgeridoo to be like the big sound of the high priest blowing in on the day of atonement, I think everybody, or Rosh Hashanah rather, I think everybody would be like, yeah, that's my didgeridoo. <laughs> because like, yeah, go ahead and grab that ram's horn blowing that, you know, the, the big end, no, the pointy end. And then it's like, ooh, that's your sound? <laughs> so it's more high pitched. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how to describe it, but you know it when you heard it. <laughs> you can't unhear the sound of a show for Jenny. Wow, okay. That being said, maybe I'm very uh, I was now. hearing the unskilled... The unskilled so- shofar sounds. And maybe if I heard like a really veteran one, I'd be like more into it, you mm. know? Hmm. That's the real question. We're going to find this out though. Let's see if we can track down the sound of a shofar. Okay. You've That's never heard one being blown? I don't, think, I don't think I have. I mean, I've, I've seen it in people's offices, but I don't. I wow. Don't think this I've YouTube ever. video that just came up was called Eight Hours Nonstop Powerful Shofar, shofar Blowing. Eight hours. No way. So much. See what I mean? It's kind of discordant. Yeah. You got the shivers. <laughs> you literally just got the shofar shivers. Yeah. <laughs> I 
never knew someone to get a shofar shiver. You asked me if I got them, and then the moment they played, you got it. Like touched a deep part of you, didn't it? <laughs> wow! Eight hours of that. Can you imagine? Oh, oh. That would be a great test. Like have someone sit, like take all their vitals, blood pressure, you know, cholesterol, uh, echocardiogram, pregnancy test, uh, <laughs> test their dopamine levels, have them spit in it, all the tubes. You just kicked me under the I table. I'm very sorry. I, I never know because purpose. are you trying to tell me to stop? <laughs> no. Okay. You never know. You got to be sensitive to the Wi-Fi, right? Uh-huh. Why? Uh-huh. Why? And then, and then have them listen to eight hours of so of powerful shofar blowing by, uh, Oh, literally his YouTube handle is just Shofar. And after wow. eight hours, do all those tests again and see what, see what effects. See what it did to your body. And soul and mind. They have to take a personality test both ends. <laughs> they got to take a spiritual gifts test on both ends. After eight hours. You might be like a mutant on the back end. You might fight like walk through walls or something. Oh. Or have a nervous breakdown. <laughs> One of the two. Well, Jenny, we're not here for that. We're here for this new year. Yes. New and year. It's a it's a good new year. I'm I'm excited for this year. You fit for the fight? You feeling fit? Mm -hmm. mm, just a couple days in. Those who are doing the reading challenge with yes. us know what we're talking about. Fit for, for the, the fight. fight. We're reading the New Testament in a year. Is it too late for people to get on board? No. Never too late? Never too late. It'll be a couple days behind. Yeah. You could catch up easy Where because it's go? one, I believe it's, we're reading one chapter a day of the New Testament oh, in the whole well, there year. there you go. I believe. And people can go to freshlife.church, online store, get the free download of the mm -hmm. PDF. There's a free version, but then there's also like a journally beautiful Which that won't come for like a week, version. so you'd be a little behind, but I mean, they yeah. may already be sold out. Maybe. Check it out. But yeah. But for free, you can download the PDF. You can read with us. Mm -hmm. Pretty exciting. Yeah. So. And it's, it's beautiful. And there's devotions alongside and um, I'm, I love it. Yep. I love doing this as a church. Well, we recorded this a little bit ahead of time. While this is playing, we're at Passion Conference, mm. uh, which is exciting. Oh, man. The Pray for, if you are listening to this, pray for what God's doing at the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, where yep. there's a generation of college students, young adults, uh, on their knees, on their faces, bowing down to worship Jesus, yeah. praying their lives are never, ever the same again, yeah. and that God uses every every speaker, every song leader, every door holder, every, uh, every part of the Passion Team, Louie and Shelly, everybody, uh, to just serve well so that this generation can be shot out from this moment like flaming arrows yeah. towards the the target of whatever God has for them. And we know we've been marked by moments like this yep. and we've been so honored to participate. So of course, while you're hearing this, watching this, uh, that's where we are in Atlanta, Georgia, serving. And it's more personal, even more personal this year because our 18 year old, it's her first time attending, even though she's gotten to be a part of it since she was, I think 11. Shiver me timbers. Yeah. That's exciting. Olivia Lusco, hopefully get in touch by God in a great way, a part of the Fresh Life contingency, mm. contingent at Passion 2024. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, today's episode, ladies and gentlemen, which we have a great year of podcast plan. We've got a lot coming up. Uh, of course, last week on the podcast, uh, well, we've been in this little break, but you heard from us uh some in December, of course, we, we couldn't stay totally silent, but, uh, next week on the podcast, we are excited to have Scott Harrison, our friend from charity water. He'll be joining us. Yeah. Uh, a great conversation, just always inspiring this guy. Every time I listen to him, talk to him, spend some time with him, even see what he posts and what he's up to. It's mm. very, very stimulating. Yeah. Because he's brilliant. Yes. And him and his wife, Vic, are some good people. Yeah. And Charity Water is doing great work love in the world. Them. But today's a Q&A episode, Jenny. I love these. Play the show for I love hearing from our listeners. I love <laughs> Sorry. chatting with you. That's right. This is our goal uh, to sit down with you, get to have a cup of tea and hear your questions and, and then just kind of go for it. Yeah. We don't, pro disclaimer, we don't listen to these ahead of time. We have no idea what's coming. I've got my Bible here. You've got your Bible there and we'll see what comes up. Yeah, there's pros and cons. If we listen to it, it could be a more studied response, but you're going to get our off the cuff actual. Maybe one of these days we will do that where we actually study. But yeah, I don't know. But I've... think about it. If you sat down with a coffee, you wouldn't get a response if you asked a question that was like a sermon. You'd That's... get. True. Well, our, our knee-jerk responses. Yeah. Knee-jerk. So, knee-jerk. 
shofar response. <laughs> okay, here's number one. This is Maddie from South Carolina. Uh, by the way, if you go to either of our websites, Jenny Lesko or LevaLesko.com, there's a place and a way for you to be able to leave a question uh, via, via voice memo or writing it out. You can do that also on our Instagram uh, link trees, which are in our profile. Hmm. Click the link tree, boom, Q&A. Ding dong. There it is, right there in our inbox, wow. waiting for the next time we come around to the topic of Q&A. Mm. Here she is. This is Maddie. Hello, Levi and Jenny. This is Maddie Rowe from Beaufort, South Carolina. And my question for you today is, how do you manage the difference in like your heart or your mind, whatever word you'd use, between hospitality and entertaining? And more than that, how do you prevent yourself from the temptation to entertain or people please versus just living with a spirit of hospitality. That's something I'm like often wrestling through and convicted in. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. What a question. Love it. Maddie. Thank you, Maddie. Um, my initial thought, and I can't wait to hear what you would say, because you have such a heart of hospitality and I am more, I'm just going to be honest with you, more prone to entertaining. That comes far more natural to me. You are so good at hospitality. The biggest distinction I would say is this. When you're entertaining, you clean the house up to perfection, to museum-like standards. And they come over and it's like this show because it's not normal life. Yeah, you know, they're not in they're not in the mix of life. They're 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 kind of it's like the whole thing from tip to tail, beginning to end, is this like curated experience. Okay. Now the 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 distinction there to hospitality is while hospitality, you're still of course going to clean the house as an act of service to the person. You're still of course going to um going to, you know, want to make sure the bathrooms are clean and life, you know, all the all the things. But it's not as much um as 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 of a sterile non real life experience where someone drops by and there's hey a pot of, of soup you're going to heat up and you're going to let them be in the mix on the on the little bit of the of the of the reality of life in the in the in the family room versus like the formal sitting room mm. kind of a spirit mm -hmm. and of course these things aren't I'm not talking the letter of the law here but I'm talking the spirit of the law it's the heart of like we're letting you experience kind of re the reality of life here and I think what you mentioned is exactly it. It's it, there's there's no people pleasing in hospitality. There's just service, and there's the the the, the realization that these people experiencing the truth of our marriage, the truth of our family, which can be a little bit messy at times, mm -hmm. and can be a little bit um, un ungroomed and un uh, you know controlled is is going to be a blessing. They're going to walk away going, there's something different about this family, this marriage, and, and that even is going to impart something to them. Mm. And I think it's so much easier uh, to keep your ego kind of there, keep everything standards high, and that leaves friendship low because they're not becoming friends with really you or what really life is like. They're, they're being pulled into this, like what you're allowing them to see. Mm. And so, of course, it's so much easier to entertain than it is to... To, to, to exercise biblical hospitality. Mm. I think it's also possible to entertain well. And there's, there's a time and a place for entertaining, you know, where you're, where you are, you know, having a party or having, you know, some event or I think, I think there is a place for both, but I think it's important to kind of understand the difference between those two biblically, biblically speaking. Yeah. I like that. I think, um, I like the fact that we're so different, you and I in this, um, because I think it goes together. I think you don't necessarily have to have entertaining moments or hospitality moments. I feel like, um, like you talked about people pleasing. And I think that, I mean, ultimately our heart is not to, not to please people, but to please God. But as we serve people, we do want to please people. Like we do want to honor people. We want to, um, serve people. And so I feel like I just, I guess I see entertaining and hospitality um, like together. And I feel like that's something that's so fun about us to like our, our perspectives are a little bit different. So we kind of like, you're always thinking about like um, mood and like music and um, 
how it feels. Well, I, I think about that when it's just our family too. So it's not like people are coming over now that, you know what I mean? Like that, those things are right. important, right? But I do think that I'm more on the side of, let's just let them see, like, it doesn't have to be perfectly clean. Like, let's just see how it is, um, how, let's just bring people into the mess. And I think that there is that difference of like, hey, let's just have you over for dinner. We can help us cook. We can, it's messy. It's not perfect. And because we had a an event last week and I was joking about, the because the next morning, like the house looks so clean and it's beautiful and stunning and like, spectacular. Um, but the day after those kind of events, I'm literally just looking around trying to find things that I stashed in like yeah, right. different cupboards yeah, and yeah, yeah. closets and things. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I just think that's all part of it. And I think really Maddie, and I, I feel like you are on, even the fact that you're asking this question, I feel like you're, you're on the right track and you're doing what it seems like it's on your heart. And so I think that that's something that's just so beautiful about hospitality is it's, is we can let the Holy Spirit lead and we can grow in it and um, we're going to make mistakes. Like I, we had um, a, a thing at our house and and I didn't do an honor moment that I felt like I, I wanted to, but I didn't because I was like, I, everyone's kind of in a different spot and, and I wish I had. And so I look back and I'm like, oh, I regret that I didn't do what kind of what I felt like maybe God was stirring in me to do, whether it was fear of what people were going to think, or I didn't want to step on anyone's toes or whatever. I mean, it was in our house, so I wouldn't be, I'd be stepping on my own toes. But, stepping on my own toes. Um, anyways, I think letting the Holy Spirit lead and it's just, it's beautiful and it's messy and it's not perfect, but it's, it's serving people. It's serving God by serving people and opening up your home or opening up your life and um, being real and honest and open and, um, letting the Holy Spirit flow through you. And I like what you said, Levi, like, and it's something that we practice in our family in a different way. But I think having dinner at the table where like the other night, Lennox set up a tea party for his sisters at, alongside dinner. But I, and I think that just that sweetness of serving each other, I yeah, just, I good. love that. And it's not going to, It'll look, it'll look different in different seasons, but... And and, the, and it's not a rigid distinction. Yeah. There's overlap yeah. in them, right? Uh -huh. There's And some people have a gift and a propensity towards, you know, um, the the service side and the experience side of it. And that's not that's not bad. You know, you, you take your spouse out for a, you know, fi to a nice place for your 50th wedding anniversary. You don't want to go, you know, to, to Luby's, you know, you're not <laughs> eating at Bucky's. You're going, you yes. know, to a place that the experience is this way, yeah. right? I think there's, there's so, so it's gears, there's overlap. We don't want it to be this rigid thing. It's like the, the, the new badge of distinction of spirituality is it's a messy house and that really serves people. You know, it's like, that's not, that doesn't honor God, I don't think. You know, you see, he's a beautiful God. He creates things of beauty, temples, very specific. So I think there's, there's, but I think the heart is really what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Are we letting people in? Yeah. In hospital, we're letting people into the reality. We're, we're putting down the veneers. We're not trying to impress people. Um, and we can do so, we can do either out of a place of service. Yeah. You know, and I think about Mary Martha. You know, the problem wasn't that Martha cared about how clean, cleanly things were and all the all the rest. Preparing. It's that she was missing the moment, mm -hmm. missing the heartbeat. And and it's not that Mary shouldn't help and shouldn't serve too, but Mary was capitalizing on the moment. And yeah. so I think that's really the heart, right? We can do both with the wrong attitude. We can be a Mary with the wrong attitude. We can be a Martha with the wrong attitude. Yeah. The heartbeat is we want to serve. We want to show hospitality and we want to, um, we want to care for people and yeah. to let them experience what is in our hearts and our homes. Yeah. We talked about this a little bit a while back with Sissy Goff, um, but just, and this is specifically within families, but just the idea of like, what we are planning is great, but the most important thing we can give to our family, to people in our lives, people we invite over is our presence yep. and being in the moment mm -hmm. and um, not letting, like a Martha, all the things trump time with Jesus, time with each other. And I think that um, we need both. And if you want to hear more about this, um, I would point you to a sermon series we did at our church, Fresh Life Church, in the fall, winter of 2022 called The Table. Yeah. 
And just, it was the idea of how God wants to use the table in your home, in your apartment, the folding card table in your mm-hmm. studio apartment, shout out Jax, uh, <laughs> to, I don't know what kind of table he has. Uh, he hasn't had us over yet, but um, to <laughs> not only bless your home and family, but to change the world yeah. and it to be an offensive weapon against darkness. Yes. So those messages meant a lot. They seem to really resonate with our church and, yeah. and, and online family. So if you want to listen to those, uh, they're there. And I hope they would be a blessing to you. All right. Next question comes from Brooks in Fort Worth, Texas. Hmm. Question is for Levi. My name is Brooks and I'm a pastor in Fort Worth. Uh, Levi, you can accomplish so much in what appears from the outside like a short time. And I, I would love to know your weekly rhythms that build up to finishing so many projects when you're also living your everyday pastoral life and, you know, putting your marriage and family ahead of all of those other things. So I would love to know, what are your weekly rhythms? Thank you. And also, if you and Jenny are in Fort Worth, my wife and I would love to hang out with y'all and grab some stellar barbecue. Thanks. Love that. Amazing. Okay. First, I want to inter- interject <laughs> and just say, Brooks, you are right. You, It seems like he can do a lot in a little bit of time and you are right. He can do a lot in a little bit of time. And I'm every day, my mind is blown at what he can fit into a 24 hour period and still get good rest. Well, Go Brooks, <laughs> uh, Jen, thank you, sweetheart. Jen and I love Fort Worth, Texas. Yes. We love barbecue and we, uh, we love pastors. So seems like a trifecta there. Yeah. And we've really discovered Fort Worth. I feel like mm-hmm. for our own personal revelation of awesomeness, yeah. we've been big down fans for a minute, but, and we've always known there was another sister, uh, at the airport. It was always Dallas, Fort Worth, but we only spent our overtime in Dallas, you know, True. but then, you know, last couple of years, we spent more and more time in Fort Worth mm-hmm. and we're big fans. We are. We like it a lot. Okay. So, um, first of all, let me say that whatever blessing it is to be highly productive, that an unguarded strength is a double curse. Mm. Okay. Double weakness. So, um, what you just said was, was, was hitting me in all the right places. And also (laughs) it's also a part of my shadow, Mm. uh, because I am extraordinarily, um, efficient, efficient, but productivity is also my heroine. You know, it's, I can miss moments. I can miss the point. I can bulldoze and blow through how people in my life are doing on a quest to accomplish all the things on my list. And so having to be aware of that, having to, uh, learn to lean into the inefficiency of people and, and God, and there's nothing convenient at all, all times about how God wants to lead us. Jesus gets baptized, ministry's beginning and all of a sudden he's in the wilderness, you know, so what the heck, right? So it's like, that's not efficient on paper. So Mm. much of the disciples is confusion and consternation of Jesus was the dude, what in the world you got the devil to kill the hell to plunder the cross to die on, but what you doing at this wedding, you know? So Mm. Anyhow, you have to hear God's voice, which is the the voice of the Father saying, this is what I want you to do. Jesus said at the end of his ministry, I finished the work you gave me to do, and I'm doing it. Um, So he left this world having not healed every disease, having not, you know, cast out every demon, having not walked on all the water. He just did what God told him to do. So what I've had to learn to do is lean into sometimes the inefficiency of the calling, but also to prioritize and to put first things first, right? Higher leverage, Maxwell and Covey talk about, you know, you know the right quadrant activities, not, not just urgent and not unimportant, but to get to that, that, that stuff that's important and high value, right? I'm butchering that, but that's, you can Google, Google Covey and quadrants, and you can also look into Maxwell, first things first, and, and those irrefutable laws, right? Put the big stones in first and you'll yeah. have room for the sand, mm-hmm. like the old sermon illustration goes. So my morning today, uh, woke up 6.30. Jenny woke up half an hour earlier than me, by the way. Uh, got to spend lush time with Jesus, watch the sunrise, Worship, pray, write, devotionally journal, read scripture, um, sit in silence, uh, got to do some reading of, 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 of a pleasure nature, got to do some of my most high priority work, which in my case is sermon writing, got to go on a five mile run, got to go uh, on in a sauna and a cold plunge. And that's all before the workday starts, all before my, as you mentioned, day job, mm-hmm. you know, so that's kind of, to me, the key 
is I did a whole sermon on this called From Evening to Morning. You can listen to it on YouTube. It was on uh, a series of messages called You in Five Years. If I do the kind of stuff that I need to do for my soul, for my health, for my heart, and for my creativity in my evening and then my morning, the rest of the day is less, you know, I'm less, I put less pressure on it because it is, is most prone to the craziness. And didn't, wasn't there a series called morning, noon and night that where you kind of talk a lot a about series this series called too? morning, noon and night, but the Which series is, from evening to morning is where I really lay out. Yep. Okay, I really yeah. lay out, you know, night times are for family and for rest. And then you begin the day with your soul and creativity. And then nine to five, it's like, what happens happens. You know, I'm less worried about it because I'm more already winning in the areas that count. Mm -hmm. Date nights, you know, time alone with my kids, exercise, all those things are, are vital. And I, I do, I prioritize those things as non-negotiables and let the tyranny of the urgent have a back seat. Mm. So that would be some of my, my best tips. So helpful. All right, Brooks. Howdy. This is Shelby Lee from Louisiana. Hi, my name is Shelby. I'm from Louisiana. I have a question about dating. When people start to date, especially like in the church or just Christians in general, what does serving the church look like as you start dating someone who you could potentially see marrying? What did that look like for you and Levi when y'all first started dating? Did y'all ever have to have hard conversations about where y'all would serve or just kind of be like, hey, we're just going to show up and we're going to serve wherever we can. Thank you, Shelby. Um, I love it. I love it. love it. Love it. That's great. Um, for us, we met serving in the church. We met serving in youth ministry. Physically setting up chairs. Yeah. Actively. Yes. So we were both taking chairs off the big rack and putting them on setting the ground, and setting them in rows. And um, so I think ground it's different. I used to mop when I was a janitor, all the things. Right. And you were a church janitor too at one point, I right? I was, yeah. yeah. Um, but I think that that, I mean, everyone's story is different. And, um, but I love though, that when you do meet in the, in the church, that that's the best, I don't know. I, that's the best place to meet. Um <laughs> But I think that um, regardless, having that heart before you're even looking or wanting to date, just serving God within the local church, serving God in church is the best place to be. Like Levi mentioned that I was a janitor. I think I was, I think I was 18 maybe. And I just wanted to be in church more. And there was an uh, there was an opening for a janitor. And I was like, I'm going to do that. So I would liter literally clean bathrooms, clean spaces, listening to like mess teachings, messages on the phone, on the um, radio. Uh, I, I would actually listen to Pastor Skip Heitzig and in my mind, imagined him as a, a short man with brown hair. But when I moved to New Mexico to intern at his church, found out that he was a very tall, blonde man. <laughs> How the Anyways, tables have turned. It's so nothing to do with this topic, but um, but I think just that hunger to be in the house and um, showing up and serving and giving, and then when you meet your spouse, like that's one of the things that's so I love so much about me and Levi's story is we we were just doing what God was calling us to do, and we met each other doing what God was calling us to do. And then we just kept doing it. And I think it's the best place. Okay. So this is Psalm 8410, David speaking. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. A day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. Mm. So here's David longing for, uh, he's actually, if you look at the actual Psalm, he's, he's actually jealous of birds that live at church. Right. And he was like, they, I just, get they never there. have to leave. Why do I have to leave? He's like fantasizing about being a sparrow who could just stay at church all the time. Hmm. And I just love that. Like, it's it's incredible to think about um, a swallow and a sparrow. Even the sparrow has found a home, the swallow, a nest for herself, where she can lay her young, even by your altar, O oh Lord. He's like, dang, that bird is so lucky because it dwells in God's house. And, and, and so he longs for that. He would rather serve in God's house 
then dwell in the tents of wickedness and be wealthy beyond measure as a, as a righteous, as a, as a, as an unrighteous Mm -hmm. wicked person. Mm -hmm. So if that's true, and if Jesus said in John 13, that you've, 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 you've heard about greatness in the Roman empire based on who's most important, who's in charge, who's in charge of it all. He says, let it not be so among you. Luke 22, he who is greatest should be the younger and he who governs as he who serves. And then he took off, of course, famously his outer robe, put a towel on and washed the disciples feet, taking the position of a janitor Mm. and washing the feet of the disciples. So here's the question. Why would you date someone who's not great as defined by Jesus? Wow. So if your spouse, sorry, let's, let's back it up. If your girlfriend or boyfriend or this person you're thinking of dating doesn't serve and specifically in this lens, the church serve in the church, but have a heart of servant service period, Jesus would be like, yeah, they're not great. Well, yeah, but they're so beautiful. They're not great. Yeah. They're wealthy. They're not great. Mm. And let the man after God's own heart say, they're not like the birds. They barely are ever in church, if, uh-huh. at, if at all. Yeah. And if they come, they're all about themselves. They're not coming to serve. That's not great. And it won't make for a great marriage. Yeah. So let the basis, be, and we just, by the way, when you were talking about being a janitor, I'm like, sexiest janitor ever. <laughs> Service is sexy. Mm. That's what you have to train your heart to actually desire. We desire the wrong things just looking at HBO Max and Netflix and Disney Plus and watching shows that, oh, this is really attractive. You know what's really attractive? A servant. Mm, that's yeah. that's beyond compare. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, it doesn't really matter where you serve. The heartbeat should be like, well, yeah, whatever's needed. Where's the greatest need? Is the great, is like, I, let me say as a pastor, the people who come in with a preconceived notion of how they want to serve, oh, I'd love to do a solo. I, I see myself singing oceans mid-stage with the spotlight on me. Oh yeah, that's that's not going to work out. <laughs> but the person who's like, uh, do you, what's the greatest need? Mm-hmm. Kids? I can do that. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, guest services. Wow, well, that's amazing. I can do that too. You know what would be so good is a someone in the intercessory prayer team. It's funny you should mention that. That's my favorite ministry. Wow. It's like whatever, you know, it's like, did I have a passion for mopping? No, but you know what I did? I mopped as well as I could. You did the same. Yeah. Toilet, is, is your calling toilets? No, my calling is Jesus. And if there's toilets on the road to Jesus being preached, well, I can do that. Yeah. Is it middle, middle school youth ministry? I don't know if I feel called to that. Well, guess what? Jesus loves middle schoolers. And yeah. if there's a need, like let's let's jump in at the point of need. Yes. And as the church leadership gets more comfortable with you, we can then hone in on, no one's desire should be long-term to see someone in an area that's not their great competence, right. but to jump in at the point of willingness, sexy, Come on. great, yep. sparrow, you know? So Love that's, that's the basis, for, I think, for being really useful in God's hand. And you, you talk about a great marriage to be in, Two servants seeking to serve each other and outdo one another in honor. Yeah. Boom. Can't beat it. No. Get a long nine foot long pole. You can't beat it even if you have one that long. Get a giant shofar. You can't beat it. I don't care if you got two shofars. I don't care if you got a shofar for both hands. I don't care if you're an ambidextrous (laughs) shofar player. You can't beat that marriage. Wow. It won't be outdone. Okay. Very nice. Good job. This is from Abby in Pittsburgh. Which is in which state, Jennifer Lesko? Pennsylvania. Very good. Hi, my name is Abby and I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I recently listened to your sermon, I Mean Business, and it really impressed upon me the importance of how fasting food honors God. I've never really fasted before and I've recently been set free from an eating disorder. So my question is, what advice can you give me or anyone recovering from an unhealthy relationship with food on how to begin fasting in order to honor God and deepen our relationship with Him? That's wonderful, wow. Abby. Thank you for sharing that, Abby. We Thanks for that question. We stand with you. Mm-hmm. We celebrate the the recovery. Yeah. And uh, that sermon, I love doing that. It's funny. I just came across the actual little written notes from when I wrote that sermon. So it's mm-hmm. funny you should mention that. Wow. I mean business is what fasting to me says to God. I mean business, mm-hmm. meaning I'm messing with the food. Jesus, when he was about to go to the cross told his disciples, I won't eat or drink again till I'm done with this. I won't eat or drink again till I'm doing this in the kingdom. He was saying to them, I love you so much. I mean business. Mm. Paul was uh, in jail and there were some Jewish leaders who wanted to kill him. And they said, we're not going to eat or drink till he's dead. They said, we mean business. Yeah. And of course, Paul did not die for a long time. And I wonder if they did 
keep up their end of that pact, right? <laughs> so tampering with food says I'm in business. Now, mm. that being said, I would, of course, caution anybody who has a propensity towards uh, eating disorders to open up what could be a gateway or slippery slope back into that. Right. Right? The Bible says don't make provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. So we need, we need to be smart. You know, I wouldn't advise someone struggling with alcohol abuse to go hang out in a bar and try and witness to the alcoholics. You know, it's mm. like that's maybe not the place for you, at least right now, yeah. and certainly not by yourself. So you would, of course, want to have wise counsel, your doctor, physically, your pastor, your small group aware of you when you do, if you do, how you do move towards fasting. You have, of course... The definition of fasting would be the abs abstaining from food for a season in order to give yourself over to, to God's word and his presence to prioritize the spirit over the flesh. But I also know that there are, there are other, there's versions of fast. There's mm -hmm. total fast, there's Daniel fast, which is uh, abstaining from alcohol, sweet food, uh, meat for a time. There's, you know, there's lots of different ways to do it. And for someone who's got an eating disorder, whether it's anorexia or, or bulimia or, or any other of those disorders, it would be a real, a red flag to just, you know, go into what could, could drag you back into that. So maybe for you, it would be something where you pull out something from your diet, whether it's sweets or alcohol or, or meat or something for a season. And you do so with uh, your community and mm. with your, your, your spiritual director, pastor, small group leader, campus pastor, or a, and or your doctor being aware of it. You know? So that would be my advice there. That's great advice. And I love that idea of um, community, like saying, hey, I'm going to bring my friends into this. I'm going to bring my leadership into this and maybe we could do it together and pray for these specific things or whatever. Like I love, I, that's really powerful. That's yeah, good advice. 100%, right? And and then they know they can check in with you, yeah. you know, and see how things are going and walk with you through it. So we celebrate you, Abby. Praise God. This is Strider. What a name. Mm. From Where do you think Strider's from, Jenny? I don't know. I would go Wyoming, Strider. LA. This is actually Florida. Oh. Hey, Levi and Jenny, Strider here, all the way from Florida. Love you guys' show, love you guys' ministry, what you guys have been doing for a number of years. My question today, um, I know it was a hot topic question, but I just wanted to know um, how you guys came about um, the scriptural authority of having Jenny as a pastor, which... I'm in full support of. I think she's incredible, but I just know that uh, this is one of those uh, topics that sometimes divides the church, unfortunately, and I would love to hear your guys' heart and, and take behind it. Thank you so much for all that you do. Blessings. Yes, so good. Thank you, Strider. That's great. I love your name. Great name. Rock and roll. <laughs> I just picture him wearing like an ACDC shirt with like the sleeves cut off. Is this accurate? <laughs> Watch, it's like a Skip Heitzig thing, like for you. <laughs> You know, he's, he just doesn't look like that at all. Yeah, of course, there's such a, a wide uh, variety of views when it comes to what role, if any, women should play when it comes to preaching and teaching, leading in the church, pastoring, etc. cetera. Um, you have, uh, for both Jenny and I, the hard complementarian view, which is basically at the, at the strictest form, you're not going to see women doing announcements. You're not going to see women if they're being, if they're being, you know, living actually out of this conviction at a real high level. Uh, you're not going to see women doing worship leading. If, if, if you really want to play that game, you, you, you should really be, be aware at which point children enter puberty, because you might accidentally have a fourth or fifth grader, you know, who begins puberty and and now this woman Sunday school teacher is actually teaching the Bible to a kind of man, you know, so you have to, I don't know, you're going to have to figure all that out. But if, you, if, you, if a woman can't teach over a man at all, because that's what Paul said uh, in his, in his writings to the ministry going on at Ephesus to Timothy and to the, uh, the church there, then in the pastoral epistles, you have better be real careful that your fourth, fifth, and oh, dare I say sixth grade teacher is not a woman because that guy, you know, he may be pubescent and we're, we're at a problem. You, you see, I'm going a little bit, um, I'm, I'm, I'm being a little bit uh, facetious here, but 
in a real strict complementarian teaching church, if that's really being adhered to, that that's what Paul meant when he said that for all churches once and forever, mm. that a woman can't teach over a man, then then to be consistent, we'd have to really b- be careful there. Right. Um, and then on the far, far other side of that, the egalitarian position, there's no difference. The veil was torn, Jew, Greek, male, woman, it, none of that matters anymore. And so women can do anything and everything a man can do, including... Uh, and especially being a senior pastor, teaching in a church, uh, there's, there's, there's no uh, differences whatsoever between the sexes. And, and, and so you have, you know, that, that position. Uh, and, and where I would personally fall in my journey, and I would say to anybody, you got to study the scripture for yourself, study this issue for yourself, listen uh, to hear the Holy Spirit. Um, I started to realize that uh, as I looked into what the Bible has to say and, and, and in earnest studied this issue for us as we started and, and, and as Fresh Life Church um, has had to come to our philosophical understanding and execution implementation of all of this, is I realized I was far more of a soft complementarian than uh, a hard one or as any kind of egalitarian in the sense that I do believe there are distinctions uh, between men and women and what they are called to do. I can't have a baby, you know, with apologies to Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's not, God hasn't called me. I'm not have that. So there are differences between us, even new Testament. Um, but I don't believe that, that the, those differences do extend to, um, to teaching, to pastoring within the church, uh, but that they do uh, include uh, the differences when it comes to the actual, you know, senior pastor Title the idea is uh, so at Fresh Life Church you'll have women who are doing pastoral ministry uh, and, and can do anything within the church and do so under under that covering or so to speak headship uh, that that I would provide as a senior pastor and Jenny and I as a, as a pastoral couple which is really what you see with Aquila and Priscilla although Priscilla's name is always first and it seems that she was more the had the the, the greater gift or charismatic uh, anointing but there was still sort of a a safety or headship i guess you could say from that 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 covering that that Aquila um, was was able to provide. But that being said, uh, you have to search the scriptures for yourself. And I just began to realize there was there was deficiencies in what our church was experiencing that were felt from only a male perspective and, and teaching, but also from the other half of Jen and I as one flesh, and also so many women within the church who had gifts that weren't being utilized. Um, and then you also have to look at church history. I mean, going from the very beginning, if women were not supposed to teach men or, or preach the gospel, why did Jesus send who he did intentionally from the, tar- the garden tomb with the message, Christ is, is alive? And the very first to ever bring yeah, that, that, that Easter sermon were women on a Sunday, two men. They taught them, hello, he's risen with the, with the anointing from Christ. But and even th- the woman at the well, the Samaritan the woman. woman at the well uh, and on and on through church history, you go, yeah. we have Phoebe, we have very m- notable, prominent women leading in just about, it would seem every aspect within the church. Yeah. Um, throughout history. You have, you, have, you have seven virgin daughters who prophesy. In Philip's case, you have so many who are exercising leadership gifts and using their their, their ministry voices and tools. Um, and, and now I wouldn't even, I, you know, make it a area of contention either though. You know, there's close-handed, open-handed issues. And for me, this would fall into uh, an open-handed issue. You know, we're not talking about Christ's resurrection, the authority of scriptures and, uh, you know, the, the, the second coming of Jesus, uh, the, the salvation by faith. This would be open-handed in how a church interprets and sees and takes, you know, passages and, and, and understands them in their current context in, when they, in which they were written versus their, you know, everywhere for all time and an eternity context to, applicable to every church and every day. Yeah. Um, I think also God made women and men so beautifully different and he created the man's brain. Like I've been learning so much about the differences between men and women. I think that's intriguing to me because we are so different. And, um, and, uh, I think I've already in the past pointed to a podcast by Lisa Harper, um, called what God thinks about women in her back porch theology podcast. But um, and she does a great job in those two episodes, by the way, of going through many of these scriptures that yes. we're talking about Yes, and point and, and helping us deal with, why do we talk, not talk about head coverings mm-hmm. and pearls, et cetera, 
So many of these things were specific issues taking place in the church at Ephesus that that were, Paul was needing to deal with. And yeah. it's inconsistent to pick and choose one thing he said to the Ephesian church without understanding in 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 context yeah. what he was saying in all of these yes. different areas. The culture, the context. Yeah, that's it's so important. Um but I think what one of the things that she and the uh the theologian she was talking to were saying was that when God made woman, he called her um helper suitable. And in the um the original language it's Ezer Konegdo. And she goes deep into what that means. And it's so beautiful. And I really would encourage you to listen to it. But um, it's just so amazing how God brought Eve to Adam and with the intent of that word, Ezra Konegdo, which Ezra is also is used to uh, describe the Holy Spirit helper. Um, and you've, you've preached this before too, but God didn't make woman to be beneath man or above man, but to be a helper suitable to man. And, um, and they go into this whole thought of, of men in ministry, but how women in ministry, when not even a marriage relationship, but just men and women serving God together, there's such a, um, a beautiful way that God is presented in that serving together and ministering to people together and doing life together. Like it's incredible. And I, and I would just say like, Levi, you were the one that would push me to, um, to preach. And you, you're the one that you, you were like, uh, our church needs to hear from oh, yeah. the mom too. Well, and I just realized, first of all, my background was more of a hard complimentary in church. And yet I realized the inconsistency because my first youth pastor was a woman. Hmm. She would never be allowed to get up in front of the church, that church and preach on the stage. Yeah. But I had gone through puberty. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, just trying to be graphic and here. And she made it a she huge impact in your made life. made an enormous impact in my life. And her life. name was Jenny. No, no. Well, that was another one. Oh, another one. The first one was name was Mimi. Oh, yeah. But um, but but I as a I was a man, <laughs> and yet I was being taught by a woman hmm. in a church that didn't believe in that. Um. So I just began to realize like when we were Dane, we're, 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 we're just noticing and, and affirming what God's already done. Mm -hmm. So for me, we were leading together. You were pastoring and women have the, having the title under my leadership in the church and our leadership in the church um, is it was already happening. We just have, have now given an honest title to what was already happening. And as, as I looked at church history and scripture, and wrestled with those things to be a Berean and to see mm. whether those things would be, as we started our church with, with the leadership that I'm under as well, uh, we, we just came to the conviction that this was an area that I needed to have the humility to say, this is, this is I, I, I was wrong as we began, and this is something we're going to correct. And yeah, so now we have, we have women or, ordained and licensed serving under, under this leadership, and we do so in our, our church, I would say, has thrived because of it. Yes, I wouldn't be comfortable with, uh, you know, necessarily uh, a situation where there was because of how I how I see scripture, a woman at the helm without her husband's side by side in that way. Mm. But that doesn't mean that for me that would be like a point of device a division over. Mm -hmm. That's not how I would have a conviction over our house. Um, but that comes from, again, me wrestling through scripture, you know? So I think we have to be convinced in our own mind. We have to not operate in a vacuum. I involved, uh, you know, uh, the the wise voices in my life and as well our, our leadership over us as we went through that journey and figured that out. And there was such a sense of consensus over it and a like-minded. And I realized this is an area where there's lots of disagreement and lots of thoughts. And uh, and yet, you know, we, we cannot deny that, that God, um, for me, created male and female in his image. Yeah. And there's something of who God is and how God wants to operate within women and something that how it operates in, within man. And so there is a distinction, yet there is a unity. And we've found pastoring together has become far more powerful um, in God's hand uh, as we've done so, recognizing the gift in you, not just the gift in me. Yeah. Um, I, 
I'm thankful for how you've pushed me because I, I personally uh, didn't grow up with women pastors and even my pastor's wife was just very like in the background and in my mind. There's a tea on Tuesday. Someone's hmm? got to get the doilies out. (laughs) Um, but I feel like I, it took a lot of you like sensing and seeing and prophetic though. words over you yes. and all of, and many, it wasn't just me. Like, could you only, you I had this vision no, of you I being, know, I know, but I was very reluctant. reluctant. I yeah. was very reluctant. And you I were hiding like behind the equipment like Saul. <laughs> I think sometimes we don't see in ourselves what God sees and what others so obviously notice. Hmm. All right, but Strider. Anyways, thanks for, thanks Thank for you, getting Strider. us all canceled. <laughs> just kidding here. What's up, Jenny and Levi? My name's Chantel. I live in Alaska. And my question today is about marriage. We love your guys' marriage devotional. um, And my husband and I have used it as a coffee conversation piece for the last year or so. Um, However, with my husband's work schedule, we are apart quite frequently. And right now we're navigating a darker season of our marriage and needing to kind of crawl our way out. What would your advice be for who has a lot of work to do, but not a lot of time um, in person to do it? Um, How can we be working on our relationship from afar in meaningful ways? Chantel, I hope you have your uh, five gallon bucket. (laughs) By the way, her husband is, should be the recruiting poster for Alaska. I follow this guy. Unbelievable. You think, you think you've seen adventures? (laughs) Chantel's husband in Alaska, he's a pilot and uh, the things he does, the fish he pulls from the sea, the crabs that stand, that sit under his boot squirming. It's a different level, sweetheart. <laughs> we met her at our um, Salt Lake City. She came to Salt Lake to come to pop the pop-up worship up, night. And uh, her husband was not there, but I have since uh, investigated his uh, comings <laughs> and goings on the internet. And I am amazed. That's awesome. I will say this. And That's I will great. forfeit my man card at his feet. I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm not a man. I'm not worthy. This man's a man's man. You I'm telling are a you something. Man. No, Alaska is like, take. The worst of California, and then you got Montana. Now take Montana, and you have Alaska. It's a different thing. It's built different up there. It's the end of the line. People who have nowhere else to go sometimes got to go to Alaska. Wow. You know, it's the Yukon. Wow. They have no other options. They got to go there. But I'm not <laughs> saying that's what this couple's done. I'm just saying that can, can be what happens. Okay. Thank you for Never that. Never been to Alaska, have you? No. One of these days. Yeah, we will. Um, thank you for that question, Chantel. Um, I think. Uh, Something that has been helpful in my, for me personally, is um, the intentionality with what I have been given with with Levi and time spent with with him. And I have been reading back in journals and I wrote, I was writing in 2009 about how Levi was on um a trip and it was really hard being home and, um, but how he like made it, it was intentional of like reaching out and texting or, or whatever it is in the different seasons of, of great travel. But I, I would just say finding pockets. I think that has been something that has been, um, helpful for me in my relationship with Jesus and different seasons where I'm a busy mom, not getting a lot of sleep where, okay, I cannot get up and have an hour long quiet time, but I'm just going to find pockets of time in the day where I'm just, God, I need you. Or I'm going to read this, this verse in this moment when the kids are napping or whatever. You're in your shower, you always kind of have those shower moments, right? Yeah. yeah. Cause I like long showers. <laughs> but those are times for you and Jesus too sometimes. Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, but also in marriage, taking, taking the little moments, like if, what time do you have? What, what ways do you have to tell your spouse that you love them and you're thinking of them and can't wait till they get back? And I think those kind of little things strung along, Very good. go a long way. It's slow slicing success, right? Mm-hmm. Ling Chi. It's how the Chinese used to kill people. You, you've heard it in culture. Like, well, Levi, what are you talking about? They literally had a form of execution called the death by a thousand paper cuts. Ling Chi, that's where we get that phrase from. Mm-hmm. Imagine being tied up in a thousand cuts to, to kill someone. Golly. No one cut fatal, but all of them aggregated together enough to, to, to end your life in a very painful way. Now, what can be done for evil can be done for good. Can't you slow slice your way to success? Yeah. Can you Ling Chi your way to romantic effervescence in your marriage? 
Uh, I dare say yes. <laughs> Can you, in your walk with Jesus, it's true. Uh, catch the little foxes and make them work for you? Because you have that parable in Proverbs, catch us, or sorry, uh, Song of Solomon, catch us to foxes that destroy the marriage because they have, our buds have tender, our grapes, our vines have tender buds. Um, but then you have in uh, Judges, Samson taking a bunch of foxes and doing God's work with them. So put your little paper cuts to work, get your foxes in the right direction, a bunch of little texts, little thoughts, take the little moments. And all of a sudden you're, you're, you have a vivacious relationship with Jesus and your spouse, bada bing, bada boom. Right. Mm -hmm. But harnessing a little, not waiting for the big, yeah. oh, at 20 years, we'll do this big trip yeah. to Europe. You know, it's like, this well, how about a text things. today? How about a little note today? How about mm -hmm. you show up today in some small way? Yeah. Good. All right. Should we end with one more from Dean in Adelaide? Yes. Hi, Levi and Jenny. My name is Dean from Adelaide, South Australia. I'm a Lusketeer. I listen to your podcast on my commute to work in the car. If your new episode is not out yet, I go back to the conversations I may have missed. Your podcast has helped me so much, and I love it. My question is to the author and both of you. I believe God is calling me to write. I may even have a book in me, but it is not an expression that comes easy to me. I talk well, but I find it hard to put my ideas to paper. Do you have any advice for someone who is starting out? I do believe I am called to write, but I know I need God's strength to use a format outside of my comfort zone. Dean. Thank you, Dean. I believe everybody's got a book in them. Yeah. Everyone's got a message. Everyone's got something to, to contribute. Yeah. At the very least, for everyone listening, at some point in your life, StoryWorth or something like it where mm. you can capture your thoughts. If you have an aging parent, buy them StoryWorth for their birthday. It emails them a question once a week, and at the end of the year, it stitches it together into a book. Mm. Everybody has a book inside mm -hmm. of them. And if, if it's nothing else than that, this is not a paid promotion, by the way. I just think it's awesome. Um, I would say now... To taking a step back, what seems t to me is that this is more than just you feel like you got a story to tell, which we all do. You all, which we should preserve for our great grandkids, mm. right? If you're living history as a part of the Holy Spirit moving in the world, goodness, this should be a record of it, honey. Yeah. Write in your journal, you know, t t take these Ebenezer's, remember these things. Yeah. Uh, but then beyond that, I would say you seem to me that you are sensing God move you towards that. Yeah. And, and so at that point, I would say a couple of things. You have to write a lot. You have to read a lot. If you're going to be a bodybuilder, you got to eat a lot of food, more than you would be comfortable with. You got to eat big to get big. So if you're going to write, you, you got to write a lot and you got to read a lot. You start, you start living in the economy of words. Reading so the ideas and the written page are constantly kind of in your head and then writing just regularly, write paragraphs, write posts, write, write essays, just be writing. It doesn't have to be anything that you think will ever be published. It's just the discipline of writing. And then when you actually in, in, in earnest are writing on a project, that's it. You just, you just got to keep writing. You got to, you got to, you know, flex that muscle. For me, if I'm in a writing project, I'll usually do a thousand word sprints per day and, and write every day, but Saturday. And then that is six days a week, a thousand words a day. You, you're, you're talking 50 writing days to get to the rough manuscript of the average book, uh, average nonfiction book. A fiction book is going to be longer, of course. I've also done it where I've done 2,000 word days and I've done it where I have written not on Sundays either. So five days a week. Um, two resources I'll point you to, Dean. Uh, Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott and On Writing by Stephen King. These two, in my opinion, are some of the greatest books you could read on the actual art and craft of, of writing. Um, and then if I was going to do one more, it would be Do the Work by Stephen Pressfield. These three uh, are among my favorite words on the art of dancing across the written page with words. And so write a lot, read even more, and uh, and just just go for it. And, and don't worry and overthink the actual writing now. And I think, you, you know, you just want to, like for me, like I would, I, would, I would write for no writing, like write because I like the words, write when there's not even any point to it. And you never know if you might come back and salvage some of what you're doing. Good. You're really good at this. I was telling Clover because she was, she's in sixth grade. She's writing something for her language arts class. And she was just so stuck because she wanted what she was writing to come out perfect. And she couldn't start because obviously hard, starting is the hardest part. But as know. she wrote... Medium, middle, end, all yes, of it's, it's hard. it's all the hardest part. It's good, That's but it's good that it's hard. Yes, 
But I have I was a sticker on my her, writing computer that says words are hard. <laughs> <laughs> words are hard. It's true. But all that to say, like, like what you just said, Levi, like just writing, just start and just go. And then editing later because she just was like, this does, this isn't perfect. And it's like, yes, but just yeah, good. write and then you'll see what If comes I gave out. one piece of parting advice, it would be what you just said. Never edit in the same frame of mind you write in. Mm. This is put well by Jerry Seinfeld, who said, when you're writing, you should view yourself uh, as a kindergarten teacher to yourself. What do kindergarten teachers do? Oh, Johnny, you did good. Oh, little Dean, you did so good. Those <laughs> thousand words you did. Oh, look at you with your glue and your paste and you <laughs> ate some of it. Oh, oh, wonderful, Bill. Oh, yo, you did it. You can do. Oh, you don't oh, do. Go poop in your pants. <laughs> you made it two days without doing it. Right. Kindergarten teacher. I don't know if that's how they actually talk. Okay. Never edit while you're writing. If you think about editing, don't even go back. If I make a typo, eh, is what it is. I'll figure it out a different day. I just write. I write like the devil's chasing me because he is. Mm -hmm. I write like I'm a little kindergartner playing in a field full of words on my typewriter. Don't have a typewriter. <laughs> I can say no wrong, do no wrong. There's no, there's no censor. There's no even theological critique at this point. I'm just, I'm just not in that frame of mind. I'm mm -hmm. a little kindergartner playing. Then I edit. And dear, dear God, Dean, please edit, right? Before anybody reads what you have to write, you should edit and then get a good editor and then trust your editor um, and, and then sparingly fight your editor. But sometimes you got to do what you got to do. All right. I'm looking at you, my editors. Uh, but, but, but when you edit, okay, now you come in, you're not a kindergarten teacher anymore. Jerry Seinfeld says, now you're a drill sergeant for the United States Marine Corps and you come in and you pick up the page and you put your cigarette out and you say, let me read this crap. Okay. <laughs> that is how you edit. You edit aggressively. You write creatively and never do it on the same day. Also, Dean, there are great writers that you could write with co-writers. Sure. Um, that is Awesome, too. I worked with a writer in my Fight to Flourish book. Dance in a frivolous field with someone else. Sounds amazing. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are out of time. This has been a rousing edition of Q&A. Before we leave, we must, of course, end as we began. <laughs> with a show for <laughs> Can you Spade. sing with it? You're very good. <laughs> <laughs> Levi and Jenny, let's go out that's how it always ends right i don't i think they do play that at the end of the podcast oh, they do yeah but today i did it so you know we'll see what they do they might get the double dose wow thank you so much for listening be sure to swing by levilusco.com and jennylusco.com to see what's going on in our world. And make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And in the meantime, we would love to connect with you on social media. Jenny, Jenny and Levi, Levi Lusco, Lusco out. out. Access more.